Okay, so I started to introduce this notion of Lorentz or coordinate invariant in the last video by essentially discussing how space-time being a manifold, we can essentially construct any set of coordinates on that manifold or any reference frame to view that manifold. Any reference frame is going to be completely valid and we're just going to have some kind of non-trivial way to transform between the, the sets of coordinates. So now we can take this idea a little bit further. If space-time is a manifold on which we've defined coordinates, well, we also know we can construct other objects like, say, for example, vectors or tensors. And now vectors and tensors are also going to have their own notion of Lorentz invariance, which we're going to now explore. So again, just to kind of start motivating this, I want you to just think about the following example. Let's just again work with R2, just because it's easy for me to draw. And now consider any vector in R2. Well, actually, maybe I shouldn't draw these axes on yet. Let's just say we're working with R2. All of the points on my blackboard here represent any possible point in R2. So this is a point in R2. This is another point in R2. And now I could construct a coordinate grid on my R2, which is essentially just going to give to each of these points some concrete set of numbers that represents that point. This would just be defining coordinates, but I'm not going to do that for now. I'm just going to work with the raw manifold itself. So on this raw manifold, we could consider something like a vector. Let's just call it the vector v. So all the information which I can really tell you about this vector is, well, it's a vector that lives in R2, and it's called v. That's all the information we have right now. Until we define some more things, we can essentially now, re well, we're going to be expecting that we're going to be able to expand this v in a basis, it is a vector, of course. But now, what basis do we use? We don't have any basis available for us. Well, this is now what introducing coordinates does. If you remember, we defined, we have vectors, we can express them using this thing called the coordinate basis. Derivatives of each of the coordinate functions. And so now, a key property about vectors that we need to realise is that like manifolds, they are kind of intrinsic objects which, can, which exist in the manifold independently of coordinates, but now they're just going to obtain some concrete real number representation when we give the manifold coordinates. So I just drew some coordinates on my manifold now, I just drew some Cartesian coordinates, and then we can immediately write down, oh, okay, well, this is the vector that has components A and B. If we realize that we have to define now the coordinate basis vector dx1 and dx2. So these are our coordinate basis vectors. Well, we build them from the coordinate system, so we need a coordinate system in order to even write it down. And now this vector gets the concrete representation in this coordinate basis as follows. Or again, we could have just used the, the shorthand of expressing the vector components as a column, remembering that each of these numbers is kind of attached to one of the basis elements. So I've just simply now introduced coordinates and we've seen how the vector kind of gets a concrete real number representation in those coordinates. And just remember that this is essentially just rewriting the vector, now expressing it in terms of some set of numbers, the components, these are going to be these A and Bs, and then it's the components with respect to 
these particular basis vectors. So now this expression here is actually going to be incredibly useful because, well, we should first now realise that this d mu is tied to our coordinate system. And now what's going to happen when we change coordinates, these basis vectors are going to change. Remember, we introduced, we could talk about the polar coordinate basis vectors. These were the vectors that kind of point along increasing theta and increasing radial coordinate direction. These are two completely different basis vectors to these. And in fact, these vectors, their actual number representations actually depends on where they are in the space. And now not only are these vectors different to these dx vectors, they actually change throughout the space. Well, we need to be really careful here when we say they change, they're only changing in this x1, x2 coordinate system. Essentially, the components of this little dr vector in the x1, x2 coordinate system, it has these components. And then when you're over here, the components have changed. But in the r theta coordinate system, this vector is always the vector that points in the r direction. And so in the r theta coordinate system, this dr is just the vector 1, 0. And same for the d theta. But then in the x1, x2 coordinate system, this is not the case. And these vectors are going to be not only varying throughout the space, but they're pointing in completely different directions to these x1, x2s. And so, of course, if the basis vectors are changing, the components themselves are also going to have to change to compensate. OK, so this is the key point now that we need to realize about vectors. Their definition, we saw we could just draw a vector on a manifold without any reference to coordinates, and it's still a valid vector. And now the actual definition of that vector has to be something which is independent of coordinates. As we've seen, this expression here just kind of is now a representation of the vector as some just pair of real number values. But we just need to remember these are attached now to these basis objects. And it's now these basis objects which are going to be changing as we change coordinates. So the, the vector itself doesn't change, but as we change coordinates, the basis vectors are going to transform, and then correspondingly, the components are going to have to also transform. So we're going to derive fully how this works in some upcoming videos, but for now, I just want to kind of really quickly show you how you can easily arrive at this tensor transformation law by essentially using this expression and realizing well, this expression has to always be true in any set of coordinates. So the vector v always has to be the vector v, regardless of what coordinates we choose to express it. So now let's just say, write down one expression for the vector v mu, and then I'm going to write in full hand the basis just to make it clear. So this is the vector components in the x coordinate system. But now this has to be the same vector as if we'd introduced any other coordinate system. And now this vector is going to have to be with respect to now our new coordinate system. I'm just going to call it y. And it's going to have to have some different set of components now in order for this to be true. They could necessarily be the same, but then you would find that the x and y are the same coordinates. So we're just going to have some new set of coordinates. I'm going to give them a hat just to distinguish them from these v coordinates. And so now what we have to realize is that this vector is defined freely from coordinates. And these expressions now just kind of express how we can represent it in the x coordinates and then just freely change to the y coordinates. And we're going to see what the, essentially the rules are for how these components are going to transform. I'll go through the calculation now, I'll save that for another video. But just to go over what I've 
introduced now, essentially we have to make the realization that a vector is a, now it's known as a coordinate free quantity, it's coordinate independent. And so now that might feel a little bit strange because while well, we're used to expressing vectors as components, but now what we need to realize is that those components don't really mean anything apart from the fact that they're how that vector appears in some particular coordinate system. So just handing me the vector AB, I know nothing about the vector unless you also tell me, okay, these are its vector components in the Cartesian basis. And so the information that's described by the vector is kind of free from coordinates, and then the, that vector is just going to get some representation in whatever coordinate system that we're using. And so as we now are going to change coordinates, we're going to see how the basis vectors are going to be affected accordingly, and we can already start to see this just by looking at a simple Cartesian to polar coordinates transformation. And so as these basis vectors change, the vector components are also going to have to change correspondingly in order that this overall, the vector remains an invariant quantity. And so I've done all this for vectors. We're now just going to briefly see that all of this holds for any sort of tensor. Just the same thing for one forms and higher rank tensors. All it's going to be is that the basis vectors are going to transform and likewise the components are going to transform. The actual one form or the actual tensor itself is going to remain invariant because all we're doing is changing coordinates on the manifold, which the coordinates were in. In the first place, they were arbitrary, and so everything else which lives in the manifold has to kind of respect the arbitrariness of these coordinates. So, as I just really quickly alluded to then, likewise with vectors, we're going to have this same invariance property for one forms or any tensors in general. So essentially any tensor that we define on space-time is going to be an invariant regardless of the coordinates we use to describe that space-time. So one of the key tensors that we've already talked about now was the metric tensor. So we saw that we introduced this object which I called ds squared which gives us the infinitesimal squared separation between two points in our geometry. And we saw that this is essentially just defined by giving the definition of a metric tensor. And so simply this definition is just how a 0, 2 tensor is defined. But now what we need to realize, as we had with our vectors, we can see, okay, we have our coordinate basis part here. If we changed coordinates, this might become some other coordinate basis, say, say we change to the y coordinates, the one form basis is going to respond accordingly. And now in order to preserve the invariance of this ds squared, if you like, if you look at the left hand side of this expression, this thing ds squared, it doesn't have any mention of coordinates, there's no x or y in sight, it's just this thing, ds squared. So this ds squared is always invariant, or now to give it its full name, it's now a Lorentz invariant quantity. Essentially now any tensorial quantity is going to correspond to some sort of Lorentz invariant. And now let's see a little bit more about what this is going to do for us. So as the basis vectors transform, so must the components. So we can arrive at some new set of components, g hat. So this would just be now the general rules or law for how we would transform between when we change to the x and y coordinates. And now remember, I'm going to start calling our transformations capital lambda or Lorentz transformation, which is going to be a map from one set of coordinates to another. So in upcoming videos we're going to fully derive the form that these Lorentz transformations are going to have. Okay, so this is essentially how we would arbitrarily change 
between x and y coordinates. In general, the metric components are going to be different. But now, what we do in special relativity is we essentially we don't take any arbitrary coordinate transformation. What we do is we say we want to only look at those specific transformations which are going to essentially keep the metric components constant. So we're going to essentially want that in any coordinate system, the metric is always going to have the same set of components. And in special relativity, we call these components the Minkowski metric and give them the symbol eta. And so when we look at special relativity, we essentially make the choice that we want to have our metric components be constant or invariant. And so due to the fact that the metric is a tensor, this ds squared whole thing has to be invariant. And so we're going to see now that this condition, that essentially the metric is preserved by these now Lorentz the transformations, this condition is going to effectively fully determine what the possible Lorentz transformations are going to be. And this is essentially now how we're going to derive what Lorentz transformations are going to correspond to. And we're going to see that essentially a Lorentz transformation is a coordinate transformation that preserves these metric components. So if you're in the x coordinates, your metric is just minus plus plus plus. And then if you do any coordinate transformation, this metric is always going to be the same metric. So this is what happens in special relativity. I just want to briefly note that this is not going to be the case in general relativity. We are going to see that metric components can change in coordinate systems. And essentially, one of the main goals that we're going to have in general relativity is trying to work out well, are, is this change in metric components something that's actually a physical um, feature of the geometry, or is it simply just the kind of artifact of the coordinates that we're using? Because, just now to give a really simple example, in Cartesian coordinates, the metric is just going to be the identity matrix, but then in polar coordinates, it's going to have some non-trivial r cos thetas and so on in the form of the metric, so then that might lead us to think, oh, well, okay, the geometry is going to have changed since the metric components have changed. Well, no, it's simply just that the metric components look funny because of the coordinate system that we're using. And so, yeah, one of the main tasks in general relativity is going to be working out whether or not these metric components look weird because we're in weird coordinates or because the geometry is actually doing something non-trivial. But for now, in special relativity, we're going to stick with the case where the metric components are essentially unchanged. The metric is always this Minkowski metric, and this is going to heavily constrain the form that these coordinate transformations can take. And we're going to see, or we're now going to fully derive, what essentially Lorentz transformations are allowed, and now essentially a way to define what a Lorentz transformation is is it's a coordinate transformation that preserves the metric components. Okay, so we're going to see that in upcoming videos, but I just wanted to already kind of start getting used to this idea of Lorentz or co coordinate invariance, because it's going to be incredibly useful, not only in defining these Lorentz transformations, but also now at looking at some more interesting properties to do with this ds squared. And so we're going to use the invariance of this ds squared in how we define the proper time, which I'll introduce in the next video.